I'm gonna talk about Parasite, even though it's the kind of film which clearly speaks for itself anyway, because it's also the kind of film that keeps its secrets, and because it was already super relevant when the coronavirus and quarantine hit and made it relevant in new ways. This video will assume you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the film's outstanding cast, there's one character that stands out as the most mysterious. And actually, it's not this guy. I think it's the kid, Dasong. He says so little, but sees so much. Although Ki Jung isn't really an art therapist, maybe we can take her idea seriously and read the film as opening the black box of Da Song's mind, as bringing the unconscious into consciousness. Maybe if we psychoanalyze the kid, we can psychoanalyze the film. In short, repression is a process in which we make a thought unconscious. But the unconscious is really unconscious. So when we say the return of the repressed, actually what that means is we only know it was repressed in the first place because it returned. Da Song represses Gunsei and the traumatic event of seeing him, but we the audience can only understand what happened when we see him ourselves. This scene where we discover the bunker is so famous and insane, not only because of the brilliant camera move, the unbroken take, and the music, but because it totally changes the film in both directions. It makes the future uncertain and transforms the meaning of the past. It means he was there the whole time, for years even, before the film started. Gunsei is unconscious because we can have no idea he's there, but his presence has effects or symptoms in the film. <laughs> he was the ghost in the house. So if Da Song seems to be a point at which the repressed threatens to return, then what does that mean for all the appropriated indigenous material? In their article, Reading Colonialism in Parasite, Ju Hyun Park allows us to approach this question by showing that Parasite is not just about the rich and poor, but colonizers and colonized. Although yes, the film still speaks to Korea's particular present in history. There's an important link between the U.S.'s invasion of indigenous nations and the U.S.'s bombings of North Korea in the 1950s, as well as the ongoing forgotten war in the Korean Peninsula. Neoliberal and neo-colonial warfare is ongoing and has effects in the film. Some are more obvious. And some are less obvious, like the reference to the draft, the use of Morse code as a language of war, and the use of English as a language of power. Is it okay with you? If you're not sold yet that the film is about neo-colonialism, read Park's article, and remember that Kiwu is only able to get into the house and get employed because he's good at English. Da Song represses Gunsei on his birthday, and he literally returns, resurfaces, on another birthday. Despite this scene's apparent chaos, it's maybe the most orchestrated, meticulously designed piece of the puzzle. Notice, as Jihyun Park says, the precise order of events where Kitek removes his and Mr. Park's war bonnets before he stabs him, so that none of the violence in the scene is committed by or to anyone wearing indigenous clothing. Da Song's fascination with appropriated native regalia links together some key elements. Mr. Park's plan to use the appropriated clothing to stage a scene of fake violence, the actual bloody violence that takes place in the scene, and the actual bloody violence committed against indigenous peoples, which is covered over and repressed in all sorts of ways. And this is all against the backdrop of a party which is less about the birthday than it is about really rich people hanging out. Actually, the house itself is established from the very beginning as a kind of battlefield or war zone. We first see it with a housekeeper cleaning up the toy arrows as if a battle of sorts had taken place. This foreshadows the violence later in the film, but it also suggests that some violence has already occurred. In contrast to the obvious, visceral violence near the end of the film, it points to a different kind of violence, in which Gunsei has to suffer in a bunker because his financial debt will follow him to his death. That kind of violence is just as real, and still warlike, I would argue, but not nearly as easy to represent. I think Bong Joon-ho's genius is to use cinematic form to outline this basically invisible problem while leaving the link between class and colonization intact. It's a hidden, quiet, mundane violence which hasn't simply been forgotten, but repressed. Why do we find all this surrounding the small boy, the innocent child? He stands to inherit it all, the wealth, the house, the bunker. He's performing the role of genius child for a culture that's ready to praise him for painting like Basquiat, of all people. Someone who made art while he was homeless and sleeping on park benches. A child is a site for the reproduction of a social order, and so it makes sense that Dasong is the point at which the truths about that social order threaten to reveal themselves. 
Maybe this is why he's the one with the ability to decode Gunsei's call for help, even if he can't know who it is that's calling. So it also makes sense that Dasong threatens to reveal the Kim family's true position in the social order. He notices that they smell the same, and maybe it's the smell of their poverty itself, of the semi-basement. He's the searchlight that threatens to expose them when they escape the house. In Parasite, the truth is a moment of danger. So the family has to hide their true identities. But it's not just about what they're hiding, I'm arguing that they repress something too. What is it? Let's go backwards from that famous reveal. The old housekeeper shows up at a very specific moment. It's right when the family starts to get comfortable in the nice house. <laughs> That's when the story is interrupted. They begin to enjoy wealth, and then discover the shock of what that wealth is literally built on top of. A little bit like Dasong, actually. We get the lights as an example of a basic technological luxury made possible only by profound suffering. In general, capitalist production depends on suffering and exploitation. And that's the film's nice inversion. We get what appears to be a poor family exploiting a rich one. Sometimes the repressed is apparent only in an inverted or backwards form. The Kims perpetuate a certain suffering in order to stay employed. And doing so, what they repress is actually, they have more in common with these two than with the rich family. They both live underground, they both live under the Park family. The Kim's neighborhood is physically below them, but in this sequence, they have to literally hide underneath them, just like Gunsei. That's when we get this utterly harrowing scene. Maybe another inversion or reversal, where the rich couple fetishizes the underwear and drugs that were supposedly so disgusting and unacceptable. When the Kims escape only to find their neighborhood flooded, director Bong keeps them linked to the couple in the bunker through parallel editing. And I don't want to sound overdramatic, but this sequence deploys the true power of cinema. If the Kims have repressed their solidarity with this couple, what Bong does is to restore that link through editing. Intercutting between the two families drives home that their suffering is linked and fundamentally the same. Moon Guang vomits into a toilet and sludge comes out of the toilet in the Kim's house. Gunsei calls for help in Morse code and the light flickers not only in the mansion, but in the Kim's house too, as if he were crying out directly to them. Through film form alone, Bong says that the two families are hurting and vulnerable in the same way, and the rich family is not. The flood is a tempting metaphor for the return of the repressed. The act begins by subtly foreshadowing water, and then we get a nice sunny day at the mansion. Then the ugly truth of class disparity appears in the form of sewage overwhelming the failing infrastructure in a poor neighborhood. We get the rock, the inert symbol of wealth and class mobility, obscured in the murky water and then coming to the surface. And some have said that this means that the rock is literally hollow, so its promise is hollow. But to me, the flickering light might be the better metaphor for repression. It's about more than stuffing unpleasant thoughts into a cartoon closet that eventually bursts open and the ugly truth comes flooding out. As Lacan says, something still speaks in the place where something was repressed. The lights still flicker even when Gunsei is off screen or even unconscious, like before we even know he's there. But the scholar's rock is important too. Kiwu clings to the promise of wealth and class mobility and it clings to him. He not only wants to be in the mansion or at the party, he wants to belong but he just slept on the floor of a gym. Just like when the drunk peeing guy reminds him how poor his neighborhood is, he takes the rock as a weapon. He picks up the very heavy symbol and goes down to the basement to kill Gunsei with it. But instead, Gunsei uses the rock to knock him out and then wreaks havoc. And at the end of the film, we get this tension where the rock is left behind in a stream, but Kyu doesn't let go of its message. His fantasy is still to get rich, rise up into the upper class, and buy the house. So what does The Rock say? I think there's something about the idea of class mobility that represses class struggle. You can move up in an economic hierarchy, but the hierarchy stays in place. Kiwu can buy the house, but the house will still have the bunker, and his old neighborhood might still flood. If he became just as rich as the parks, his wealth would be just as tied up with settler colonialism and the exploitation of workers. <laughs> Such a nice boy, and yet he came to the structural conclusion that to move up in the world, he had to kill someone below him. 
rather than mobility between different levels of a violent class system, isn't it about guaranteeing every person certain rights so that we can live dignified lives? And if that sounds like communism to you, uh, cool. This is all to say that what is repressed in the film, class disparity and colonialism, is also repressed in our social reality. I write this in April 2020 in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdown, and suddenly the bunker resonates in a different way. We're all going a little stir-crazy, isolated in our homes. Are we all Gunsei now, if in quarantine we also have to identify spatially with the bunker? I guess my point is, if you're working class, like the Kims, we were always already more like him than we realized, even before quarantine. Workers are precarious and vulnerable in the same ways as the people who can't even join in on the regular exploitation of the working class, like prisoners, refugees, or detained migrants. And quarantine reminds us of them, reminds us that we ought to have solidarity. We're between a virus that exploits our congregation, our proximity, our togetherness, and a parasitic economic order that makes real solidarity difficult. We have the odd paradox of voluntarily isolating ourselves in order to protect our communities, and now we have people calling for an end to the lockdown so that they can return to their comfortable lives, which are made possible by the work of other people. How do we take care of each other when the logic of capital doesn't care whether we live or die? I'll never see a flickering light in the same way again. And since the virus only made clear what was already falling apart, I wonder what other images, what signs, what symptoms we have that are calls for help we still need to figure out how to read. The thing is, as much as Kiwu's plan remains within the bounds of neoliberal capitalism, we want it to succeed. We want the scene to be real. In my heart, I want Kiwu to see his dad again, to free him. But even if he can leave the bunker, he can't leave the house. Eventually, we will see each other again. We'll come out of isolation, but it will still be capitalism outside. Why does Bong give us the dissolve to black like it's an ending and then return to the first shot of the film? Because, as the reverend says, no one is free until we're all free. <laughs>